Yeah. I'm... Um, good morning. This is Zach. He is going to give a talk. And if you stay afterwards, we have more wonderful prizes for coming to a talk this morning. Thank you, Molly. So this talk is um, sorry, it's nothing related to that DPL thingy, but it's actually related to, to my job as a researcher. And the, the main topic of this talk is how to actually reuse dependency solving across different package managers, both within a single distribution like Debian and among different distributions. So the talk, the work which is presented in this talk is actually shared by many people of the Mancusi project. And one is Ralph, which is taking a picture of me right now. Uh, and there are other people which work with us on this project. And in general, we care quite a lot about Debian. And this is a good moment to thank the Mancusi project for actually supporting also my general work in Debian as DPL. So the, 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 in this talk, we, I basically go through three different parts. The first one is uh, uh, what we are lacking in dependency resolution in today package managers. Then I will present a format called CUDF, which is aiming at being a common format to describe dependency resolution uh, scenarios in um, package-based distribution. And then I talk about the implementation of this format. And finally, even if it is not in the index yet, about um, a competition to find kind of the best technique to do dependency solving that we have run recently. So just take a step back and think for a moment at the notion of distribution. And basically think about why we do what we do in distribution like Debian. So essentially what a distribution is, is a man in the middle between upstream software authors and final users. Um, and the goal, of, the first goal of a distribution is actually to ease software management to make it easy for a system administrator, a system administrator to uh, have a coherent set of softwares installed on a given machine. And the key idea to actually make um, easy software management is the idea of a package. So we, do, we have this kind of uh, uh, granularity of package which denotes at which level you can install, uninstall, upgrade, maybe even downgrade a specific piece of software. And the killer application which we have built for the past kind of 17 years, on top of the notion of package, are package managers. So package managers are our killer application that we use to sell, even if we don't sell it, um, sell what we do to our final users. So what actually is a package manager? So the, the idea is to make both easy and flexible doing software upgrades. And with upgrade, here I mean, I mean something very generic, so I will use the term upgrade for even either installing, removing, upgrading, downgrading, any kind of change we do to a package which on, uh, on our machine, we call it upgrade. So the first task of a package manager as we know it today and is to add abstract over package retrieval. So what a package manager does is um, avoid that the user have to manually download the software to care about the security, the, the, mm, to care about being secure that this package is really belongs to its author, and all this kind of stuff, it's taken care of for us by a package manager. The second feature of a package manager is the actual low-level deployment of packages on disk. So once you have retrieved the software embedded in a package, the package manager takes care of installing it on disk and takes care of all fancy details which can be very, very complex to get right, like triggers, like transactions, like the management of confile to avoid that user changes are lost upon upgrades, like diversion alternatives, and all these fancy features that we do have in DPKG and that exist also in other distributions. The, the third point of a package manager is dependency solving. So the idea is that when, you, when the user wants to install a specific package, you just say the name of that package, but to install that package, you might need a lot of other softwares, which are stated in the metadata of the package. And the goal of the package manager is to install all missing dependencies so that you can have a, a working system, identify conflicts so that if you want to install two packages together that cannot be installed together, it will warn you. And more importantly, to compute upgrade path. So a kind of very important task of a package manager is to help you migrate from one release of a distribution to another. And to do that, usually we have a lot of different ways. You can have different choices. And the role of the package manager with its dependency solving engine is to compute the uh, 
uh, the best upgrade path between the status you are now and the status you want to reach. So my question here is, is dependency solving in today's package manager as good as we want? And the, the big claim here is that it is not. It is not for various reasons. The first reason is what we call incompleteness. Incompleteness means you request something to a package manager to install a specific package. There is a way to install that package, fulfilling its dependencies and avoiding all conflicts, but your package manager is not able to find that solution and to propose it to you. So this is a very simple example, which works in the sense that it, with, sorry, it works with apt-get, in the sense that apt-get is not able to uh, fulfill your request in this case. So the example is you have two packages, A and B, and you have two different versions of that packages, version 2 and version 1 of each of them, and you have a kind of cross-dependency. So version 2 of package A depends on version 1 of package B with a strict dependency and vice versa. If you ask apt-get to install both of them, by default, without any pinning, it will fail, because it will try to install the most recent version of both packages, and that's, that's impossible. While it is clear that there are at least two solutions to fulfill the user request, installing version 2 of package A together with version 1 of package B, and vice versa. So this is a very simple example. There are others. And it's just to, to show that what is complete incompleteness is, and that what we really want is completeness. We want a tool that each time a solution exists to what we ask him, it will, what we ask it, it will be able to propose us that solution. The second reason why we claim that um, dependency solving is not yet good enough is that it's not very flexible. It has a poor expressivity. It does not allow the system administrator to specify very specific and interesting policies like, you know, you know what, among all the possible ways you have to satisfy my request, I want that you choose one which minimizes the installed size on disk. Another example is, OK, I want to install KDE or GNOME or something big, and I want you to propose me the solution which minimizes the download size of all the packages I need to retrieve. Okay? And this is, for instance, interesting for if you have very slow connection. If you have an alternative among two packages, and choosing one package means uh, retrieving a very, very big set of packages which are its dependencies. And if the other alternative means retrieving just one very simple package, if you are requesting policy, this kind of policy, you want to, the second choice to be taken. There are tons of other examples. For instance, uh, you might want to selectively not trust specific maintainers. So you might want your package manager to uh, avoid completely to install packages maintained by a person you do not trust. Or you might want to Whatever. So whatever kind of uh, preference you have on the choice of uh, how to satisfy your request is a policy that we might want to ask the package manager to implement, and we are, not, we are not there yet. Finally, there is a kind of engineering problem. So implementing dependency solving seems trivial at first, but in fact it is not. So um, in fact it is an NP-complete problem, so the complexity is potentially explosive. And um, we, have sh we have been experiencing with naive implementation of dependency solving, and they are either incomplete, as we saw, or they can loop, or all this kind of problem. So um, I would say that the engineering problem, the point is that we really would like to factorize out dependency solving engine and reuse it across different package managers, because reusing is what we do best in free software. Uh, so this is the idea. The idea is to have a way to not re-implement dependency solving again and again in all package managers out there, but to reuse them. And where can we reuse them? Well, we can reuse it, first of all, within specific distributions. For instance, in Debian, we have different tools which do dependency solving, sbuild, pbuilder, apt-get, aptitude. And the kind of way they do dependency solving change. So you have some kind of um, non-predictable choice and that might mean that while a package build on your machine, maybe it doesn't build on the build D network. So a goal in, uh, an, an advantage in sharing dependency solving within distribution will be to have this kind of uniformity. But then let's be bold and let's try to see if we can share 
dependency solving across different distributions. Because the problem is the same that we have as the problem that Red Hat have, or Fedora, or Ubuntu, or OpenSUSE. The basic problem is, all this, it is the same. And finally, it is interesting to reuse a solver between we geeks and the community of scientists. Because in science, there are, there are quite some people which, the, which do this kind of dependency solving and this kind of constraint solving. And on one hand, they are interested in having our data, because our data are real data, uh, not built just to test some specific constraint solver. And we can benefit from their expertise in doing dependency solving. So let's make clear that the end goal is not having a standard package format. It's a goal that I, I don't think it's worthwhile, because the package format is very specific of distribution, and it's used to implement the policy of that distribution. Uh, while the end goal is finding not really the best solver, but actually to uh, try to identify what we need and finding the best implementation of what we need, possibly with the flexibility, with the flexibility which enables us to specify policies different than to other distributions. And then, if we find something that fulfills this need, well, then at that point, we can either deploy it in, a, in every single package manager or deploy it in a separate library that we'll, we will use across different package managers to do dependency solving. So our proposal to do that is a format called CUDF, which stands for Common Upgradeability Description Format. It's a format in which you describe upgrade scenario in which you describe the problem that a PTGET has to solve when you ask it to install a package that cannot be trivially installed. So um, the structure of this format is based on three different parts. The first part is what we call the package universe, and it essentially is the set of all packages which are known to the package manager. In terms of APT, it's the all packages file that lie in varlib apt lists. Then we have the package status, which is the set of packages which are currently installed. It is usually a subset. Actually, it is always a subset of the package universe, because the package manager is aware of all installed packages. And it only contains the currently installed packages. And finally, the third part of what this format can describe is the user request. So what, do you, what did you ask to the package manager? What is your goal? What is the goal of the user? So what is difficult in... Uh, designing such a format. So, as always, when, we, when you think about designing a, a common format, the problem is abstracting over the specific features of a specific package manager. So the first challenge we have in designing such a format is version numbers. So the, version, the semantic of versions changes significantly from distribution to distribution. So this is the first challenge that we need to, fa to face, how to have a common representation of versions. Then we have package relationships, which are the same in all Debian-based distributions, but are different on like RPM-based distributions. Then you have lexical conventions, like the fact that the name of packages are different in Debian and in different distributions. Then you have the semantics of virtual packages, which is kind of peculiar to each distribution. And finally, you have a sharp difference between the, the world of Deb, a Debian-based distribution, in which you can install only a single version of a package at a time, and the world of uh, RPM-based distribution in which you can install different versions of the same package at the same time. So the format is a plain text file format. It is inspired by RFS, RFC 822. And it's a list of stanza, as we have in packages file. And each stanza is a set of type key value pair. So this is a very simple example, a kind of uh, hello world. Um, so in here we see just two packages, M4 version 3, the dependency line, we have comments, and this is another example of with package OpenSSL. Um, I said that the key value pairs are typed, meaning that each property can, also, can only accept values of specific types. And here we, I have a brief overview of the types we have. We have integers, we have positive integers, booleans, package name, which are kind of very liberal because in, in the world of RPM-based distribution, you have package name like slash bin slash bash. This is a package name. It's not acceptable in Debian, but it is something that if you want to support in such a format, either you allow that character to be part of a package name, or you need to do some form of, ex of escaping. Um, then we have package formula. What are formula is what in Debian are for us the dependency line. 
So they are a Boolean formula in which you can express disjunction, a conjunction of packages, and where each package can be associated to a specific version constraint. Uh, and then we have package lists, which are just a degenerate case of this, where you have only commas, which are uh, conjunction and not disjunctions. So um, a CUDF document is then made of several different stanza. You have the first stanza, which is the preamble, and which is optional. Then you have uh, the whole universe of packages, one stanza per package. And in the end, you have the request stanza, which encodes the user request. So this is a kind of a skeleton of a CUDF document. You have a preamble, a lot of packages, and a request in the end. Um, let's see what are package stanzas. So a package stanza describes a single package, and you have several properties which you can use in a package stanza. Some of them are mandatory, some of them are optional. So the, the package property is the package name, as in apt list, and it is mandatory. Also, it is mandatory to have version. And version are integers, and I'd see in a, in a bit why. And then you have a very important property, which is installed, which actually distinguishes between a package which is in the universe, but not installed, and the package which is installed on the user machine at the moment where the request is, uh, is stated. And then we have some kind of uh, usual suspects. We have depends, conflicts, and provides. Um, let's see some highlights of packages in CUDF. So the first important difference be with what we do in Debian is that versions are not strings, but versions are integers. And this is the, the best way we, we found to abstract over differences of versions in different distributions. And the idea is that every single distribution has its own semantics for versions, but in, in every single distribution you, can, you have a total order. You can take a set of versions of the same package and order them totally. And uh, once you have done that, you can map that order to integers. Um, provides is used to encode what in Debian we call virtual packages and what in RPM-based distribution we call features. Um, what is different with respect to Debian is that the provides are versioned. So you can do something like provides HTTP version greater than two, and actually, you are not forced to have a single version, but you can have an um, inequality like in this example. So that package which provides HTTPD uh, greater than two will be able to satisfy all dependencies on HTTPD, which are from three and upwards. And if you, don't so if you don't specify a specific version in a provides, that means that that package provides all possible versions of HTTPD. So it will be able to fulfill all dependency requests on HTTPD. Last important highlight is that conflicts are not implicit. So what does it mean for a conflict to be implicit? It means that in distribution based on DPKG, if you have two versions of package bash, version 1 and version 2, you have an implicit conflict between the two packages. You cannot install the two packages together. You don't need to specify a conflict on bash, because it's implicit. This is not the case on RPM-based distribution. And in fact, this is not a big difference. The point is that in Debian, when we need to install different versions of, of, the, of the same software at the same time, we just encode the version, name in the, the version in the package name. Think at the Linux kernel. It is a single software, but we have different packages which have the, the name of the kernel in the, in the package name. Um, so if you want to achieve what we have in Debian, well, you do something like this. You have package bash version 5, and you, you declare a conflict with bash. As it happens in Debian, self-conflicts are ignored. So that essentially means that you cannot, you cannot install this version of bash together with all other versions of bash. Uh, and this works also for uh, virtual packages, and this is something we know pretty well in Debian. So how we do a mutual exclusion between sets of packages which are providing the same feature, like postfix and exim, well, we provide a specific name, main transport agent, and we also declare a conflict with that name. And that is exactly the same in CUDF. Um, what is interesting about CUDF is that the set of properties you can associate to packages is not close-ended, but is open-ended. You can have whatever extra property associated to each package, 
like download size, installed size, a maintainer string. Uh, you can declare some priority. You can declare the suite the package comes from. It's, it's very, very much free form as long as you declare the property in the preamble of the document. So here, we are stating that the rest of packages in the, in, um, uh, in the universe have a suite extra property, which, the, which is an enumeration between stable testing and unstable, and which defaults to stable. You have a bugs property, which defaults to zero and is an integer. You have a property called pin priority, to encode the pinning, which is an integer and which is mandatory. You have to specify that on every single package. A request stanza contains a request like a header, and then one or more of install, remove, and upgrade. And each of them is actually a um, uh, dependency formula like bash greater than three. So having a request to install bash greater than three means that the user wants to have installed whatever version of bash which is greater than three. And you can have something, some weird stuff like uh, less, mm, less than two or this kind of stuff which are not expressible with APT usually. And when you request an upgrade, you are basically enforcing the fact that you want only one version of the upgraded package installed in the end. So this is a complete example of a CUDF document. Uh, there is a, a lot of packages. There is no preamble because it's not needed. And there is a request in the end. So all this has been specified in a technical document, which you can find at www.mancusio.org slash CUDF. And uh, it is a, a specification document with some uh, features, like having a, a formal semantics, which is very useful to double check implementation of the format so that you can verify whether they are in fulfillment of the semantics of the specification or not. Uh, there is a, a separate format, the UDF, to which I will come later, which is used to uh, capture uh, upgrade scenarios from users in a way similar to Popcorn. And there is a kind of a primer document, which is very simple to read to get started with the format, which is available at this URL. So what the format does not support yet, even though it is forthcoming, is multi-arc. And the problem with multi-arc is that it is no longer true that a pair package name, package version is enough to identify a package in the, in the universe. Because you can have um, different packages which have the same name, the same version, but we each have, which have different architectures. So the fact that package name, package version was kind of a key in the format was a, a basic assumption. So we need to change a bit the specification to support that. And uh, <clears throat> another thing we don't support yet is the, uh, the locally rebuilt packages. So if you look at the code of APT, there is um, a kind of heuristic which enables to distinguish uh, a locally rebuilt version of a package from a, a ver or an official version of the package which has the same name in the same version. So this is something as well that it's, we need to add in the format. It is implemented in a library called libcudf, which implements parsing of the format, pretty printing, um, the consistency check, basically meaning that you can check whether an installation has some dependency prob problems or not, and implements solution checking. So verifying whether a proposed solution by a package manager is actually in fulfillment of the original user request. The code is OCaml, and I think this is not a surprise for anyone who knows me. Uh, <laughs> but there are so C bindings which completely hide the OCaml layer. So you can use just the C library, not even knowing that there is an underlying OCaml library. It is LGPL, and you can find it at this URL, www.mancusio.org slash CUDF. There are also Debian and RPM packages available, still in a um, separate repository, and we'll come back to that later. OK, this is just an, uh, an example of how does the command line tool work. So you just provide an universe, and you can check whether it is consistent or not. Uh, you can provide an universe. And OK, this is an example where it finds something which is not consistent, so cannot certify dependencies. Uh, this dependency is called Turbo of a package called Gasoline Engine, and that means that you have installed Gasoline Engine, but not one of its dependencies, well, you know, the, the usual kind of stuff that APT can, can tell you. Um, so where is this deployed? So um, we're quite happy about the, the acceptance of this format. So there is initial CUDF support in a, a package manager called CAPT, 
which is a kind of alternative package manager to APT we have in the archive. Even though it's not the last version of the specification, but there is interest from the package maintainer to, to go that way. We are discussing with the APT and APT2 maintainer on how to have support on CUDF in the official package managers. And the idea is not to, to have different APT package lists. The idea is to enable package managers to, to spit out a CUDF representation of the dependency problem they, they are trying to solve. Um, and actually, it is also supported in distributions other than Debian. For instance, the URPMI package manager is the package manager used in Mandriva, is able to, to support CUDF and spit out reports in this, in this format, and uh, is forthcoming in RPM5. Um, so, what we did with all this? So, as part of the Mancusi project, we have run a um, solving competition where we, can, we kind of have a, a big set of uh, CUDF documents, meaning of upgrade scenarios encoded in CUDF format. Um, we offered them to the scientific community. There is a a community which is interested in seeing how good they are and how fast they are at solving constraint problems, most notably the SAT community, people doing uh, SAT solving. And um, we kind of try to check whether out of this community we can in, um, raise their interest in using their technology to solve dependency problems, and in particular the shortcoming I discussed in the beginning of the talk. So we held a, competi a competition at a workshop called LocoCo, which stands for Logics for Computer Component Configuration. And it was uh, June, I guess, right? It was la Ju last July, sorry. Um, and in that, we had two different tracks, like you can compete for different goals. And we had 11 solver participants in two, in, uh, across the two tracks. And we, the competition is over, and we'll j briefly go through the result, but all, all the information is available at this URL which is www.mancusi.org slash misc-2010. Um, so we had to track. One track we call the paranoid track for the really paranoid system administrator. And in that track, the goal was, well, to satisfy the user request, but in doing so, minimizing the number of removed packages so that you do not remove some software which has nothing to do with the user request and to minimize the number of changes in the installation status. So essentially, the intuition behind this track was, um, OK, I need to have something done, but please touch the least you can touch, so that you don't screw up with other stuff which are installed <laughs> on my machine. And this, we believe, is a kind of typical policy that a system administrator with a machine at risk would like to, to have implemented. A completely different track was what we call the trendy track. So in the trendy track, it's kind of for the desktop user or anyhow from a user which would like to have the, the most recent software. So in, in fulfilling the request of the user, the track required to minimize the number of removed packages, because we think this is a kind of general requirement, uh, minimize the number of packages which are not at the most recent version. So it is written this way for... Uh, uh, to have the, the formal encoding done right, but essentially mean upgrade as much software as possible to the, to the most recent version. Um, even more so, minimize the number of recommends, which are not, uh, um, sorry, minim maximize the number of satisfied recommends of installed packages. Meaning, each package you install has a set of recommends. Please install also these recommends as much as you can. And finally, uh, minimize the number of newly installed packages. This might seem a bit counterintuitive, but when you ask APT to install Bash, you don't want it to install 15,000 packages just because they are in the archive. Okay? Uh, to each of the, uh, in the various track, we, used, uh, we have used different set of CUDF, uh, of, sorry, different set of CUDF encoded upgrade scenarios. So we had some, some problem coming from uh, Debian DUDF, which is a tool you, uh, UDF save, sorry, which is a tool you can use on Debian machine to, to submit your upgrade scenarios to us, and then we show where you can find it in a moment. So, and then we, we created some artificial problem trying to, uh, to make the life of package managers miserable. 
So we have easy, difficult, and impossible problems. So essentially, we, we took different mix of Debian suites. So in easy, for instance, we took Debian Unstable, a basic uh, uh, desktop scenario, meaning you just install Debian Unstable and you choose the, uh, the desktop task and see what you get. And on top of that, we created artificially various requests in which we request to install it, either install 10 packages at a time or remove 10 packages at a time, this kind of stuff. For the more difficult part, we had it's written stable and unstable, but it was testing and unstable. Uh, oh, sorry, stable and testing. Well, whatever. And uh, to install, ten, even in this case, add, uh, increasing the number of suites, doing install or remover of removals of lots of packages. And then in the impossible track, we kind of all, all stable, stable, testing, unstable, doing upgrades from one release to another and kind of increasing the number of available packages and see how the dependency solver reacts. Um, so the web, as I told you, we have uh, different solvers coming essentially for these uh, six teams. So the first one is a solver based on a technique called answer set programming. Then we had a solver coming from a Portuguese university based on a sat based solver. We had APTPBO, which is a nice hack done by the uh, distribution called uh, Kaixa Magica, in which they took an APT uh, package manager and equipped it with Minisat Plus, which is an open source uh, um, SAT solver, uh, PBO actually. Um, we had another university of Louvain providing its own solver. We had P2, which is the kind of the package manager integrated in the Eclipse platform. So Eclipse has its own SAT solver used to solve dependencies, and we used that, and it was participating in the, in the competition. And then we had a, um, a team from um, University of Sofia Antipoli participating with the proprietary software. And the results are that, unfortunately, the winner in both tracks has been the proprietary solver, but the second one was the, the solver of P2, based on the SAT solver called SAT4G. And... Um, Okay, this is it for what we have done. This is how you can help. So if you go to mancusi.debian.net, you will find uh, various things. And in particular, in particular, you will find the... Uh, oh, I'm offline. Oh, well, I have some network problem. But anyhow, here you will find a, a non-official IPT repository. And in particularly inside it, you will find that package called uh, uh, Mancusi Contest, like popularity contest, but Mancusi Contest. And in it, there is an utility called DUDF Save, which is just a wrapper around apt-get or around aptitude on the command line. So if you find a kind of dependency problem which the solver is not able to find a solution, you can just rerun it, prepending DUDF Save in front of it. And that will produce a... Uh, CUDF document, which you can then upload to our server. We guarantee anonymity and all this kind of stuff. But it is a way to actually contribute to a corpus of upgrade problem on which we can then try to improve dependency solving over the years, uh, offering these uh, problems to the scientific community which is interested in working on them. So that's it. I'm ready for questions. Um, if you don't have any question on the content, please consider also suggesting your favorite upgrade policy. We are, we are really looking for some fancy upgrade request that, you, that system administrator might have and which we can offer as a challenge to people doing solving. Thanks. There was a question over there, I think. Okay. Ah, Bastian? Okay. Now it's on. Okay. Works. Okay, I have actually two questions. The first one is, uh, how do you deal with um, different packages, uh, package name for the same package? Like you said, uh, bash and user bash. I if it's say the example again. Uh, you have the package bash, and yes. uh, in uh, Fedora it's called user bash. And it's okay. How do you deal with that? So, in fact, with this kind of format, we are not meaning that you should use packages from different distribution on the same machine. It is just a way to uh, capture in a single format upgrade problems coming from Fedora and coming from Debian okay. and 
have them encoded in, in the same semantics. So it is not something that user can or should use to have different packages from different distribution on a single machine. This is not the goal for us. The goal for us is uh, improving dependency solving technologies so that both Fedora and Debian user can benefit from it. So, no, I, I was, when you map uh, versions to integers, yes. I think that, that, you know, that's a pigeonhole problem uh, in mathematics, which tells you that no. you can't do it. Mm -hmm. So, but you could do it, do it to rational numbers, because then you can always squeeze, and rational is just two numbers, it's easy. Well, the, so, so the, the universe we, of packages we consider is closed. So a single CDF document only deals with a fixed set of packages, which is actually also already the case in package managers. So when you ask RPT to solve a dependency issue, it only considers the package that it knows at that moment. And given that the universe is closed, you can map directly version of the same package to integers without losing any information. Yeah, but every, uh, every time you do the encoding from scratch. Well, one policy that I typically need as a sysadmin is that I have a domain of packages that I want to be as up-to-date as possible, but the rest of the system must be stable. Okay. So imagine I'm a Python programmer, so I want to have all the Python-related stuff as up-to-date as possible on a okay. stable system. So basically you were saying that the two kind of policies we had, trendy and uh, paranoid, you want them to be applied to different cluster of packages in your system. Okay. Don? Um, and how are you dealing with the different possible paths for dependency resolution? So, I mean, I know that it's always possible to have multiple ways of resolving yes. the dependency graph, including uninstalling everything. Um, okay. So how is that handled? Okay, so the, the long-term plan, so at this level, in CUDF, we have encoded only the semantics of package upgrades. So the, the, spe the specification tells you formally when a solution is really a solution to a user request and when it is not. And all the, 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 po the track we had in the competition were kind of not defined within the CDF semantics. So we had separately a way to compute the, the value of the solution. The long-term plan is actually to have a language in which the system administrators can encode their own request. So the idea is to have a small language in which you can actually encode what you, what you want to do, like minimize the number of uh, installed packages or whatever. And this is not yet in the CUDF semantics, but it will, it will be coming. At the moment, I mean, we just, so we did the, the easy part, let's say. We just said, okay, the track one is optimizing in this way. And how it has been done, it's been up to the solvers. Um, so I actually... Where are you? Oh, Phil. I actually have two questions. The mm -hmm. first one is, why weren't multiple architectures being considered in the first place? Because I know that RPM is doing it for quite some time yeah. to allow co-installability of multiple architecture packages, and just Debian doesn't yet. Um, and the okay, I, yeah. I apply to that. And then. So in fact, the, the, in the, let's say, ad hoc standardizing committee of this stuff, we, on the Debian side, we have been more active than the VN people which were on that. So it, it should have been up to them to raise the problem before. We didn't really think about it in the beginning, and we, it occurred to us later on. But so the solution, we have the solution, it's kind of easy. It's just up to generalizing the notion of a unique identifier. So you basically add to each package a unique identifier, and in that unique identifier, you encode the architecture, or in fact, whatever you want. So that is a kind of uh, <laughs> historical reason. Of course, there are also the chains on the architecture. Yeah. Right. Um, and the second is, somehow that format seems to be useful for upgrade reports to collect uh, um, the information on upgrades, what the user wanted or what was available at that point and what was installed at that point. Are the to tools mature enough to do such a thing? Um, so for what concerns APT get, yes. So it is fairly easy because apt-get only have kind of a single run of dependency solving. So with an external wrapper, you can easily capture the, the situation. So yes, for, doing this, for capturing the user problem in these upgrades, the tools are mature enough. And in fact, one of the commercial distributions which is participating in our project is using this technology to collect problems for their own user and offering support to them via their own support channel. 
For what concerns aptitude, no, the tools are not yet good enough, but the point is that what we have now is an external wrapper, while aptitude internally can do several iterations of solving, so we would need to hook into the code to actually, at each step, capture the, the scenario. So it is totally possible, and uh, Daniel Barros is actually interested in doing that, it's simply we, we haven't yet come up to, to actually doing that. Um, with the version provides, is it possible to give a, a range of version numbers, or can you only do uh, ranges which are unbounded on one end? You mean in the dependency specification, or...? Uh, well, with the dependency, you can uh, depend on versions greater than that and conflict with versions less than that, and, th and that will give you a range, but you can't okay. do that to say, I, only pr I provide this interface between versions 3 and 8. So we, are not, we cannot express all of the possible ranges, but we can express the, uh, the closed one in dependencies and the open-ended one. So we, we, miss, uh, we are not complete in, in the ability to encode all the ranges, but as far as I can tell, all the ranges we have found in a real package manager can be encoded. Yep. I'll, uh, well, I can say that. I can just say that. So, in future version of the format, we are going to add an explicit operator that will enable us to encode all possible ranges of versions. Um, I didn't see anything in there which allowed you to encode the fairly important property of whether you actually chose a package or it was automatically installed. Wh whether you what? The, I mean, the apt has gained the functionality that understands the difference between something you explicitly asked for and something that was just produced. Uh, something that was just. Um, I'm not doing this very well, am I? Sorry? I didn't get that. Okay, so um, that is exactly the example of, uh, of something that you can encode with extra properties, but we, for which we didn't see the need of having it in the core set of properties. So you can very simply add a Boolean and a property like uh, um, leaf or root or whatever, I don't know how it is called in, uh, I don't remember how it is called in IPT terminology, and with that Boolean encode whether the package has been explicitly installed by the user or not, and you can easily define uh, an upgrade policy say, saying, please remove all the packages that have this Boolean set to true if you can do that, respect independence. Okay, fine, so that works. Uh, so I'm glad you already mentioned multi-arch. The other similar aspect is um, differently optimized packages. So, um, you know, you, what we'd like to provide is be able to provide different, at the moment we encode that in the uh, package name, you know, mplayer i686, okay. which is a really crappy solution to the general problem of uh, different variants, different builds effectively of the same thing, which might be your local build option, maybe that provides that functionality, but that's, yeah. that's so certainly a class of ways you wish to optimize, and we may need, I don't know if you need extra functionality to express that or not. Yes, so more generally, I mean, let's say generalizing the answer to your previous question, the format is open-ended, you can define extra properties, and the idea is that you do that exactly to then ask the, the dependency solver to optimize on specific uh, function of those properties. So yes, you can have an extra property, a custom property, which express how, optimized, how much it optimizes the package, and then ask the package manager, please maximize this or that. Okay, I have another question. If I understood your format correctly, you don't have any notion of uh, what we c have in Debian as recommends and suggests. How are you planning to deal with this sort of kind of soft depends? Okay, so we actually have used recommends already in the trendy track. And once more, the reason why it, that is not explicitly in the format is because the correctness of a solution does not depend on the fulfillment of those soft dependencies. So even with APT, Aptitude, or the package, other package manager we have in Debian, if our solution is correct, uh, ignoring the recommends, then it is correct also considering the recommends. So what we did in the track where we asked to optimize our recommends is to have an extra property called recommends, and specifying that what the package manager should uh, optimize is a function of that recommends all over the package universe. Okay, so you're planning to implement this as kind of um, policy for that the sysadmin sets? Yes, that's it. How do you handle uh, the removing of a package in, uh, in, an, in uh, the archive, the unsupported package? Uh. Okay, so uh, the point there is that 
it is already the case that package managers only care about the current status of the system they see. So they don't have a, like a perspective of the evolution from one state to the other. With APT, when you do APT get update, you basically throw away the previous status and like retrieve the, the new status and you kind of join it with the status of installed packages. But it will not remove the unsupported uh, package. Sorry? It will not uh, remove the unsupported uh, package. APT. Yeah. Ralph, want to say something about that? Yes, yeah, sure. Okay, so that's in fact a good point, and I think this is also a point which can be handled with extra properties. So you could have, well, currently we model both the packages which are installed on the machine and the packages which are available to apt in the same way. But you could change it and add an extra property which indicates a flag, say, which says, well, this package comes from unstable, or this package comes from testing, or this package comes from stable. And in that way, you could just add a policy which says remove all packages which are not also available in stable, for instance. Thanks. Over there. Oh my, you have a lot of questions. Sure. I was wondering if you would um, looked at all into um, optimizing upgrade pathways or just um, you know consider the endpoint. Because for instance, it could be a problem t if you have a package that provides a service um, to have it, you know, be um, I just unpacked and have, have the service not running for an extended period, or for instance, yes. um, in the case of hard conflicts as opposed to opposed to breaks, to have um, the package uninstalled al altogether temporarily. That's true. So this is a kind of, uh, of one end a shortcoming of this approach, and then on the other end, uh, deliberate in design choice. So the point is that the semantics of the format is what uh, we call them. We call it transactional. So we have the initial state, the, set, the, the package manager compute the final states, and we just assume that you, you will magically go from one solution to the other. And this, again, is already the case in current package manager that first compute a solution and then kind of decide how to implement it, asking the underlying low-level package manager to do that. So this is actually how to cal compute a the optimal upgrade, upgrade path from the current status to the status find by the package manager is part of our future research, and we actually have a project which will start on that, but we are quite confident that the two things are kind of separate. So you can safely first compute a solution, and maybe encoding there all extra requirements you get from uh, this kind of uh, constraint, and then decide how to um, deploy that on system. Anything? Okay. Okay, so um, since this is NP complete, have, are you also looking at how to encode strategies that solvers use? Because it seems, okay. you know, so a solver may come back with a strategy, but it'd be nice, well, it'll come back with a, with a solution, and it'd be nice to somehow templatize that and turn that into a strategy in the okay, future. Okay, so uh, let's say that in the project we, are, we have all the various expertise, so we are kind of on the side of uh, encoding the problem formally, and this kind of... Uh, uh, low-level strategies are actually being implemented in the solvers. So there are the, the team of people which are working on that are doing this kind of optimizations. So in, unfortunately, unfortunately, as I said, not all the solvers we have on the, on the project are um, open source, but most of them are. So the, the strategies they are implementing are actually available and can be looked at to, you know, to, to mimic them and, as you say, to templatize them. Anything else? Franklin? Are you ever aware of some efforts to have database uh, for the various names uh, and to connect the projects among, dis among distributions? As you mean like mapping pr different properties to... Uh, the names, just the names of the project and being ah, able to say bash, bash is named bash in Debian, but maybe it's oh. not. That's an interesting question because, so as part of our future research, at some point we envisaged that having a separate infrastructure, which was actually in charge of doing what you just said. So to actually map the name of an upstream project to different packages. And this is kind of interesting when you start thinking at the cloud, because you might have different machines, like a Debian and a Red Hat machine, 
which like uh, have a dependency one on another, like a web server on one side, depending on a database on the other. And at that point, you need to know that a dependency with, as seen by a specific distribution may have a different name of a different distribution. So we kind of acknowledge that need, but we don't have the, that yet. And actually, we don't have a plan to go in that direction. We have time for one more question, if anyone has a last question. Okay, thank you.